Hello, everybody. It's noon Central Time, September 6th. Uh, we're going to start our webinar. Thank you all so much for joining us today. I just want to give you a little bit of background information uh, about where we're coming from and the reason why uh, we're organizing uh, this webinar today. First of all, there's tremendous uh, interest in this novel technologies. As a matter of fact, we had more than 500 people registering for this webinar from 15 different countries. So that's a sign of the global interest uh, around this technology. This uh, event is being organized by myself, uh, myself, Rodrigo Verley. I'm an associate professor and extension lead scientist at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Also by my colleagues, uh, Dr. Chris Proctor, lead science associate extension educator at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and Dr. Anita Dille, a lead science professor at K-State uh, University. And we're organizing this event with the assistant of our colleague, Mr. Glenn Nice. Uh, Glenn is the PAT, Pesticide Applicator Training Program Manager here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And Glenn has helped us with the registration and the promotional uh, material. So thank you very much, Glenn, uh, for your assistance, okay? Uh, so this event is part of a research grant uh, that myself, Proctor, and Dele have received from three different uh, institutions. The first being the National Corn Growers Association here in the United States. Uh, the next one, the uh, US North Central Soybean Research Program. And the third entity, uh, the One Smart Spray Company. Uh, Proctor Dilley and myself, uh, we have some funds uh, where we're conducting research uh, with this novel technology. And as part of this grant, uh, ge generating awareness uh, like we're doing here today is one of our uh, objectives. Uh, we have our program uh, in front of you. Uh, today, we're going to have five different uh, presentations. I'm going to give the first presentation where I'm going to share uh, the results of a survey that we conducted at the end of the 2021 growing season. Uh, our second speaker is going to be Dr. William Patzold. And uh, William is the Director of Agronomy uh, with Blue River Technology. And William is going to be talking about Sea and Spray Ultimate, a new tool for weed management. Our third speaker is going to be Mr. Aaron Hussinger. Uh, Aaron is the demand creation manager uh, with One Smart Spray. And Aaron will present on the D1 integrated reliable solution for small for smart weed control. Excuse me. Our fourth presentation uh, will be given by Mr. Nadav Bosher. Uh, Nadav is the CEO and co-founder of Green Eye Technology, and he will present on precision spraying, how to maximize savings and efficacy through an aftermarket approach. Our fifth presentation will be given by Dr. Tom Wolf. Uh, Dr. Wolf is the owner and also the writer of Agrometrics Research and Training and uh, Sprayers uh, 101. Okay, so we're going to have five presentations, about 20 minutes. Uh, per presentation. And at the end, uh, Dr. Chris Proctor and Dr. Anita Dele uh, will be moderating our Q&A session. And we're going to be using the questions that you all have sent us uh, during the registration project. We received some really, really good uh, questions from you all. So we thank you for your participation. We're going to be asking those questions at the end of our event. And then for uh, the uh, certified crop advisors here in the United States, so we're going to have a slide at the end with a QR code where you can get the pest management credits for uh, today's webinar. So the goal of this event, as I mentioned, is to generate awareness and address agricultural stakeholder questions regarding novel technologies with real-time camera-based weed detection systems for site-specific weed management, which I'm going to be referring to uh, as spot spray technologies uh, throughout this webinar. We have three major players uh, that are uh, joining us today, uh, being the first one, John Deere and Blue River. So John Deere, uh, it's an equipment manufacturer. Uh, John Deere acquired uh, Blue River technology a couple years ago. So here we have an uh, equipment manufacturer uh, with the technology. Uh, which will be part of their new sprayers, okay? 
The next group that's joining us today is the One Smart Spray. And the One Smart Spray is a joint venture between Bosch, a technology company, and BSF, a crop protection uh, company. So this is a different approach uh, where we have a technology company with a crop protection company, but they're not sprayer manufacturers. And then the last one is going to be uh, Green Eye, which is a technology, com uh, technology company. And one difference here between uh, Green Eye and the other two uh, groups that I just described is that the Green Eye system will be able to be installed into existing sprayers uh, that are out uh, in the landscape uh, already. And then to wrap uh, uh, our presentations today, we're going to have Dr. Tom Wolf. Uh, he's a pesticide application technology uh, specialist, and he also writes for Sprayers uh, 101. I invite you all to check uh, his website, sprayers101.com, where he's written some great articles about pesticide uh, application technology, but also uh, focused on uh, spot spraying. So we look forward to hearing what he has to share with us uh, today. Okay. So all these technologies have uh, their differences. Uh, the one common thing is that they use camera-based uh, weed detection systems, okay? And these technologies uh, have evolved in the sense that in the past, the technologies that we had available for spot spraying, they allowed us to do what we call uh, you know, green and brown. So applications uh, in a burn down scenario where you could treat uh, the weeds, but no crops were present. What these technologies do now they can recognize the weeds into established crops. So they allow for what we call a green on green application. So as you travel with your sprayer, this cameras detect the weeds and a foliar product can be applied only uh, to the weeds. And this is uh, why I think these technologies are very, very exciting and there's a lot of potential uh, around them, okay? So with all that said, I'm gonna switch gears here and I'm gonna talk a little bit about a survey that we conducted at the end of the 2021 uh, growing season. Uh, this survey was conducted as part of that grant that I described uh, earlier by myself. And I also wanna acknowledge uh, my co-authors, uh, my PhD student, Zai Moglic, our former uh, postdoc, Max Oliveira, uh, and also Dr. Proctor and Dr. Dilla for their assistance uh, with this survey. Uh, the survey, uh, we put it out as a Qualtrics uh, link uh, in the fall of 2021, and we kept the survey open until the spring of 2022. And uh, with this survey, we had three major objectives. Understand what are the current weed control strategies that farmers are utilizing in corn and soybean production systems here in the Midwest of the United States. We wanted to understand what are the main weeds that are escaping such control strategies. And then the last portion of the survey was to have an understanding of farmers uh, in our industry regarding the upcoming spot spray technologies. Where are we at in terms of understanding uh, what these technologies can do for us? And where do, they, where do we think they fit in our systems, okay? So we selected uh, part of the data uh, from from our survey to be presenting for you here today. Uh, we will have two major groups uh, throughout the rest of my slides. So we are gonna have what I'm gonna be referring to as the Western group. So these are the responses that we received from the state of Nebraska and Kansas, okay, where we have higher adoption of no-till agriculture and we receive less rainfall as compared to the other region, which I'm gonna be referring to as the Eastern uh, portion uh, of our survey area here, which includes the state of Minnesota, Wisconsin, where I'm speaking from today and where I act, and also uh, from Illinois, okay? Uh, respondents, uh, they were a mix of farmers and or crop consultants. So most of the responses I'm gonna be sharing uh, with you today came again from uh, either farmers or crop consultants. So one of the questions uh, that we asked our participants is how are they managing uh, weeds in their soybean cropping systems? And for sake of time, I'm only gonna be focusing on soybeans here today. But what you're gonna see here uh, in the results is that half or more than half of our respondents, they indicated that they're controlling 
weeds and soybeans with a two-pass chemical program being a pre-emergence herbicide with soil residual herbicides followed by a post-application of a foliar herbicide with the addition of a residual herbicide product at that time, which we call here in the United States as a layered approach, okay? So that approach is being adopted by most uh, uh, participants of our survey, okay? And that is a recommended strategy by academics, by extension folks, and also by industry for management of some of the difficult to control weeds that we're dealing with uh, across uh, the United States uh, Midwest, okay? So again, this is a very popular approach that several of our growers are adopting, a two-pass program with a residual herbicide at planting followed by a post-layered residual uh, program. And the reason why I'm emphasizing the word residual is because that's gonna come back again towards the end of my presentation. The next question uh, that we asked our participant is, okay, you're adopting this control strategies. What are the weeds that are escaping such strategies? And what you're gonna see here for the uh, Western responses for the states of Kansas and Nebraska, Palmer amaranth was the number one weed that despite those strategies, the two-pass program with a layered residual approach, folks are still seeing escapes of this weed, okay? So Palmer amaranth or Amaranthus palmieri being the uh, number one response uh, in the states of Kansas and Nebraska, followed by water hemp, uh, which is Amaranthus tuberculatus. And the third species there, the most uh, common species that escaped control was volunteer corn. Now moving to our Eastern states, Illinois, Minnesota, and Wisconsin, water hemp was our number one for Amaranthus tuberculatus followed by giant ragweed. A giant ragweed is very problematic uh, in this region, okay? And our third species, similar to the Western responses, was uh, volunteer corn, okay? So these are the main weeds that are escaping control. And we gotta keep these weeds in mind because these weeds have evolved resistance or they're resistant to our common herbicides that we're using in soybeans. And they also have this extended emergence window. So these weeds, they pose a challenge to our current weed management systems, and they're going to continue to pose challenge to this novel technologies, uh, one of them being the one that we're discussing here today. Now I want to switch uh, gears and talk about the third aspect uh, of our survey, which was to better understand the interest and awareness uh, amongst our farmers and crop consultants regarding spot spray technologies. The first question that we asked is whether folks were familiar with targeted herbicide application technologies. Uh, about 65 to 68% of them said yes, they have heard of these technologies, whereas at least 32% have said no. Thus, the need for events like the ones we're having here today. The next question was whether they thought targeted herbicide uh, would be adopted in the acres they manage in the near future. And the results are surprising, uh, especially if you look from the respondents from Kansas and Nebraska, indicating that 48% were not sure and 48% indicated that they think that these technologies would not be adapted, adopted, excuse me, in their systems in the future. Now you look at the Eastern responses here, Illinois, Minnesota, and Wisconsin, 53% indicated that they're not sure whether these technologies, spot spray technologies, will be adopted in their operations in the future. They need more information, and 31% said no. Thus, it's clear that there is a tremendous opportunity, especially for us on the extension side in our industry, folks who are coming up with these technologies, uh, to generate more awareness and discuss that the value that these technologies will bring uh, to weed control systems. Here's the last uh, question that I want to, the results of the last question uh, that I want to present uh, to you today. And the question was, how do you foresee targeted herbicide spraying technologies being adopted in corn and soybean production fields in the near future? And what you're going to see here is that the majority of the response is 57% for folks from Kansas and Nebraska and 49% uh, according to folks from Illinois, Minnesota, and Wisconsin, 
is that they think this technologies would come as a strategy uh, for late season weed control or for control of late season weed escapes. Okay? And if you were to ask me this question two years ago, I would be in the category as well. That was my mindset. These technologies are coming up. The way we're going to use them is we're going to go out there and we're going to target weed escapes and we're going to fry them. This was my mindset two years ago. Working on this project uh, from the past two years, I've quickly realized that this is not a sustainable idea. First, I think as we're going to learn today, the systems here, they need to be able to recognize the weeds in between rows. So the more advanced your crop is, which is the case here, your you know, ca crop canopy is closed. So the ability to detect the weeds becomes very difficult. And on top of that, finding chemicals that will control weeds at this stage, it's going to be very, very challenging with the resistance uh, issues that we have out there. So the analogy that I like to make is, you know, putting the spot spray technologies up against a scenario like this one that I have in this picture from a late season weed control standpoint, it's like buying a Ferrari and, you know, to use it around the farm. It just, it just does not make sense. And I think we're going to learn more about that today. Okay. And then I talked about residual herbicides and that's what I want to bring it back here. Okay. So during our survey in the fall of 2021, our survey participants, they had a chance to add comments. And then when we were thinking about spot spraying, one thing that they kept bringing is what about residuals? We're always talking about residual herbicides as part of our layered approach, right? Putting residual herbicides as our post application. But if we're, you know, target application, we're not going to be treating the entire area uh, with a residual herbicide. So that may not work. And that was also a concern of mine. Okay. Until again, I started working uh, in this area here. Our lab has done uh, collaborative research with the one group. Here is just a research prototype. And I think what's really neat and what we're going to learn more about today is this two tank, two boom system, okay, where we have one of the tanks uh, connected to the smart application, if you would. So you have the camera based detecting the weeds, triggering the application where the weeds are. But then you have the second uh, boom and tank system that could deliver a broadcast application across the entire area of your residual herbicide. Or if at that point you were doing an insecticide or a fungicide application, there's tremendous opportunities there. Okay. So to wrap up my portion of the presentation, what I'm doing here today, I copied and pasted three questions that some of you uh, sent us. Okay. And I think they uh, do a good job summarizing, you know, some of the things that we got to be uh, thinking as we move forward uh, with this particular technology. The first one is, have you tested the quality of weed control as a function of percent savings, right? When we, when we talk about spot spraying, we're thinking about reducing the amount of herbicides utilized. We're thinking about savings, okay? But we have some difficulty to control weeds out there and we cannot afford escapes, okay? So there's a fine balance here between managing our resistant weeds uh, and saving uh, in crop protection products. The next question is how do we ensure integrated pest management with the systems does uh, prevent you know, a rapid evolution of further herbicide resistance. We don't wanna, you know, we don't wanna select for more resistant weeds out there. So how do we put these technologies to good use uh, so we slow down the rate of uh, resistance evolution across the landscape? And then the last question that I think is very pertinent, and I think this uh, systems here, they, you know, they we we can focus on the savings, but they also uh, open up opportunities for different ways of weed management in the sense of if we're doing spot applications, perhaps the opportunities that might be available for us 10 years from now, as far as uh, chemical control options, they might be quite uh, different than what they are today. And not only from a herbicide standpoint, but also from an adjuvant standpoint, okay? So with that, uh, this is my last slide. I leave here my contact information. I wanna thank you all uh, for uh, joining. I wanna thank my colleagues for helping us uh, coordinate and organize this webinar. And I want to thank the great speakers uh, that we have here for you all today. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my presentation and I'm going to invite my colleague, uh, Dr. William Patzold to share his screen and then start his presentation as well. So William, the mic is yours. All right. Thank you. All right, just doing a, a little check here. 
Can you see my presentation? Yep, we can see it and we can right. hear you well. Thank you. All right, thank you. So a little bit about myself. I've been with the company now for almost uh, seven years. And so I have a unique distinction. I was I joined Blue River before it was acquired by Deere. So I'm one of the old guys in the company, but it's been a, a fun seven years. So I'm gonna to talk to you about Seam Spray Ultimate, a new tool for weed management. Uh, the introduction, I'll just talk about the Seam Spray product line, talk about Ultimate specifically as a collection of technologies, and then go through advantages of Seam Spray Ultimate along the way. Then I wanna focus on our, our methodology of targeted sprays. So let you, you know, insight in terms of what design considerations did we have for coming up with our method of application. Available nozzle tips, and then a few comments about research trials, both commercial scale trials and the small plot research uh, that we've been doing. And then I'll end with some take home messages. So the Seam Spray product line, there's currently three that have been introduced, starting with Seam Spray Select introduced in 2021 for fallow applications. That was followed up with Seam Spray Ultimate introduced in 2022 for fallow and in crop, so green on green. And then introduced uh, this year with Seam Spray Premium. So this is a performance upgrade kit. So for certain existing John Deere sprayers, you can now add a, a kit to do Seam Spray applications for fallow and in-crop use. So the focus of today, I'm just gonna be talking about Seam Spray Ultimate. So what is Seam Spray Ultimate? First of all, it's sensors and computers. So we have sensors or cameras that collect images in real time. There are 36 along 120 foot boom that feed images into computers, what we call vision processing units or VPUs. There are, there are 10 on the equipment. Uh, they process the images on board the square to identify crops and weeds. So you don't need an internet connection. Everything is done on board the machine. <clears throat> Next we have a carbon fiber boom, a brand new boom built by John Deere and a new software to go with it called Boom Track Ultimate. So the first is the desire for a more stable boom. So height is monitored continuously and Deere claims this is the most stable boom they've ever built. So it's important for uniformity of image collection and for the targeted applications. So the carbon fiber boom was built to provide a stronger platform for improved stability, but also to reduce the weight of the boom. So equipment was added, uh, computers and cameras and a more elaborate plumbing system. And so to add weight, uh, so weight was coming onto the equipment, they had a desire to take weight away from the boom so it's more neutral. The next is the, the dual tank delivery system. So there are dual tanks in the picture. You see on the upper right, here. upper right, there are two numbers. So there's a split tank and there's numbers one and two. So one would be a smaller section of the tank for doing scenes for applications and two would be for the broadcast. <laughs> so you can split the tank so you can do a broadcast spray and a theme spray uh, treatment in the same pass or a user could decide to combine them together into a single tank to do either all sea and spray or all broadcast, right? So the advantages as well is that mixtures are kept separate all the way through to the, to the nozzle tips themselves. And again, the ability to broadcast residual, like was discussed previously, having the ability to broadcast residual and do sea and spray in the same pass. This machine allows for that. But what's been fun is to do the research on, are there advantages of using this dual tank beyond sea and spray? And the answer is yes. And so first of all, if, for nozzle tip selection. So now imagine that you could pick the, a different tip or spray quality that, that matches the product you're spraying, uh, applying through either tank one or tank two. So there's an advantage there in terms of nozzle tip selection. <clears throat> the other one would be on, Product antagonism. So the ability to reduce or eliminate antagonistic mixtures of specific products uh, you know, when they're separated. So I have pictures of this on the right. So now imagine 
a single tank mix where you're putting dicamba, glyphosate, clethodim, and tolachlor going after volunteer corn. And at these rates, there's some antagonism where you don't get full control of the volunteer corn. If you would split those compounds and say broadcast the clethodim and metolachlor, have that separate from the dicamba glyphosate as a seam spray, you get better control. And so these pictures were uh, taken in 2021. We followed up with research with our university partners in 2022. And so it does work. And then the other advantage would be tank mixture restrictions. So since there is a dual tank, everything is kept separate all the way to the nozzle tip. You really have separate mixtures. It's not a tank mixture. And so with that, there's potential for dispensation of tank mixture label restrictions by separation in the dual tank. So now I think dicamba and glufosinate, you can't mix them today in a single tank because it's a tank mixture, but you could separate them and apply them in the same pass, say for ha now having multiple effective sites of action for resistance management. The other new thing for the seems for ultimate is the accuracy in the data. So accuracy, better accuracy is now obtained with Starfire 7,000 receivers. And then all the data collected from the machine, so spray maps and lead maps is now uploaded to the John Deere Operations Center. So now you have that available with all the other information in Operations Center to now include spray maps and lead maps. <clears throat> so the data piece is also important. All right. So Scenes for Ultimate, again, publicly introduced in March of 2022. Uh, commercial machines are out in the field as of 2023, working in uh, soybean, corn, cotton, and fallow production systems, 30-inch uh, row spacing or greater in crops for now. So it's a green on green enabling over the top applications. <clears throat> so now what I wanna talk about design considerations for the method of application. So from day one, I gotta tell you, I've heard everything in terms of internal criticism about our machine and, and how it does it. But hopefully I'll, I'll talk to you, I'll give you some insight in terms of why that is. <clears throat> all right, so first of all, we had to think about our boom heights. So with the way the cameras are, that dictates our boom height. So optimal is 26 inches from the ground. And as the plant canopy gets to be six inches, we now maintain a 20 inch gap between the top of the canopy in the bottom of the boom, all right? So we need to think about that. Our boom motion, uh, so with boom track ultimate, at the, the tip of the booms, we can expect a 10 plus or minus 10 inch difference 95% of the time from the set point, right? So we know there's gonna be boom motion a little bit. We also need to consider the products we're gonna be applying, all right? So we need to legally apply products according to the label because the label is the law. And so we must work with products uh, requiring specific nozzle tips. And so if you think about soybeans and cotton, where the vast majority of the products are going out are Ingenie, Extendamax, Tavium, and List 1 and List Duo that have specific nozzle tips on the label, we need to be able to use those nozzle tips or get new nozzle tips on the label. <laughs> and then the other criteria we've used is we have to allow the ability to follow maximum minimum rates for uniformity in the targeted areas. And for that, we relied on the ISO specs, which is listed here. So for some herbicide products, there is a maximum rate, but there's also a minimum rate. So if you think of Ingenia, for example, the maximum rate allowed is 12.8 fluid ounces per acre, but that's also the minimum rate. So if we're not meeting the minimum rate, we can't follow the label, all right? Other considerations. We must allow 12 mile per hour rapid speeds are greater. So everybody's going to want to go faster. And so, but uh, uh, for 2023, 12 miles per hour, we want to have multiple nozzle tips to be able to better match and pair with products. <clears throat> then we also have what's called fallback mode. Let's just say there's something happens with the system. So a blurry camera, dust, boom too high, going too fast. The system reverts to what we call fallback mode and then it broadcasts. So this ensures that we're always going to get adequate weed, adequate weed control. So again, if something is off with the system, it reverts to a broadcast mode. So then what that means is we have to seamlessly transition between sea and spray and broadcast. And so that, you know, the, the method of application that we choose has to be able to fit that as well. 
And then uh, the nozzle bodies that were required are exact point nozzle bodies and 15 inch nozzle spacing. So all of that together is what we needed to think about in order to come up with a method of application. All right, so what do we do? <clears throat> so in terms of nozzle activation, the sprayer decides the number of nozzles to activate in real time. So now we have this water hemp plant here. And then to spray it, <clears throat> all right, we need to activate this tip. And so our machine knows the, the width of, of the nozzle and what it takes to apply those droplets, you know, on that target. So we need to activate not one, but another nozzle tip because that's contributing droplets, but also any nozzle tip that contributes droplets to the target has to be activated to get the right dose. So if we don't, we're underdosing. So again, it makes the decision in real time based on what we input the characteristics of the nozzle tip, but the, the system decides. Oh, again, I have to point out here that this is for illustration points only. You know, this has nothing to do with rate, uh, you know, depicted in here. So again, this is just a depiction of our, our how the nozzles work. All right. But the number of nozzles activated varies by nozzle type and boom height. So that is depicted here. <laughs> Let's just say in this top row, we have wide angle nozzles at three different boom heights. And so if, if you're using a really wide angle nozzle, like 110, 120 degree, you're gonna activate quite a few with a really high boom height because of the width projected of those droplets on the ground that all contribute to hitting that weed. At a normal boom height, a set point, like I said, 26 inches, you would have your nozzles activated. If the boom goes lower, you'd have fewer yet, right? So one way to save even more money is to have a narrow angle nozzle tip um, that's depicted here at the bottom where you'd have fewer nozzles activating because it projects a smaller pattern on the ground. But you don't want to have it too narrow because then you have problems with uniformity. So it's kind of like a sweet spot between having enough coverage um, to, uh, to get the right dose, but not having too narrow that you now don't get the right rate applied in your known boom motion. All right, <clears throat> exact point nozzle bodies and caps. And so we have in the, if you look on the back, the bottom of an exact point nozzle body, there's gonna be six positions. So one through three is dedicated for broadcast. And that is in the leading position. And positions four, five, and six are the trailing positions are dedicated for scene spray. You can have all these different combinations and paired broadcast and scene spray. And to switch the nozzle tight, you just twist the nozzle body to get the combination that you want. So you can have multiple tips on there preset to go and just select the ones that you want. <laughs> so for the scene spray nozzle tips, to allow for faster application speeds, we rear incline the spray. And so this can occur from a couple different uh, ways. One is built into the nozzle tip. So think of the 3D nozzle tip that's already inclined. You just put them all uniformly inclined together. We've also designed two different caps that are inclined. So one we call the R4 cap, which holds you know, standard T-Jet Hypro style tips. And then we developed the L4 for the T-Jet AI80 family. So these are all the, the nozzle tip options available for scene spray as of today. So there's a wide variety. So you, it's up to the user to choose which ones they want. And they vary, uh, area treated will vary by nozzle tip because it's defined by the spray angle. And then new options are in the queue. But you know, there's a, a wide variety of, of John Deere Hypro nozzle tips, uh, different orifice sizes and matched up for a particular cap. Uh, we have a bunch of from T-Jet as well. And then uh, the green leaf agar top of the spot fan nozzle tips for, for fallow applications, but a wide variety of nozzle tip. So each tip has to be tested and characterized prior to use. And each tip is unique, offering the most efficient targeted application. Nothing is specifically about Dicamba and 2,4-D products. We have multiple tips that fit the criteria that were already on the labels or new ones that were put on uh, by our request. And so 
If you look across all the different dicamban 2,4-D products, multiple options are available that are, are labeled. And uh, what was fun is I just got to update the, this one this morning. So our uh, this PSTSL, so TS stands for target spray. So we've been working with Hypro to develop a new line of nozzle tips specifically for scene spray. So, so as of today, yes, labeled means are actually on the company websites if you go to the company websites as an extension of the label. <laughs> But again, the user is responsible for following all the regulations regarding pressure additives and technicians. Just as just referring to the nozzle tips. All right, <clears throat> commercial field trials. We've been doing them since 2020. Uh, this video that you see is actually taken by me in, in the cab in 2021. Uh, one of the fun things about doing research is actually writing in the equipment. And uh, so we've been using prototyping commercial scene spray machines starting in 2020 through, through this year. The research team has been internal Blue River Technology Agronomy and John Deere. And we've done multiple sites in the Midwest and Mid-South regions of the United States. We also have miniature uh, scene spray ultimate machines. So these are designed for small plot work to work together not only internally, but also with private research organizations and universities. We've done multiple, there's been multiple sites across the United States. And so this has been a fun project uh, to work on and how do we get equipment in the hands of, of universities and other people as to do third party research. Uh, as of today, we, we do work with uh, universities. There are currently five. The purpose there is for them to evaluate scene spray performance. So we're working with uh, University of Arkansas, Purdue, North Carolina State, Virginia Tech, and the University of Tennessee. Uh, the picture that you see there, we recently hosted them at our internal research location in Mississippi. So we get together multiple times a year and uh, talk back and forth about some spray research. <clears throat> so I'm not talking about research today, but you know, you know, we do present quite a bit on some of the research. And so some of the questions that we have, this, these are just examples. We have you know, scores of different objectives, but you know, we, with the commercial trials and the small plot trials, we're answering questions like, what's the influence of sprayer settings or nozzle type? Uh, what's the importance of residual chemistry? Rodrigo talked about you know, layered residuals and you know, different pre-emerge herbicide programs. And so that's definitely things that we've tested, but also single versus dual tank herbicide programs. And so now imagine, you know, see a scene spray ultimate, you could put a single combined tank and just go out and do scene spray. But then if you do that, you're not, you can't broadcast residuals. So what are the trade-offs of doing a single versus the dual tank? And this is all the research that we've, that we've been working on. And so the, the, how we present this is going to be through external presentations, state, regional, national, and hopefully international weed science meetings coming up uh, next year. Uh, we routinely attend the WSSA North Central and Southern Weed Science Society meetings, and that is the bulk of, of how we're going to be talking about this in, in the scientific meetings. We've also had the people, our university collaborators, go to the Beltwide Cotton Conference. We've talked to the EPA three, three different times over the years. We've presented it to John Deere customers and dealers, and we also have um, pretty good relationships and presentations with the agricultural chemical uh, in our chemical industry partners. Two minute mark, William, thank you. Okay. All right, my last slide, take home messages. So what is Seams for Ultimate? It's a new product offering, taking advantages of new technologies for weed management, but it's also, it's a collection of technologies bringing multiple benefits. So it's more than just Seams for itself. <clears throat> our method of application is designed to allow for uniform and rate accurate applications to the targets. And the dual tank system can provide new opportunities. Think of nozzle selection, um, antagonism, elimination of that, and the dispensation of tank mixture restrictions. We have done hundreds of small plot and commercial trials to date uh, since 2019, and we're going to continue to talk about our research at scientific meetings. So uh, please be aware of that. Attend WSSA, North Central, the Southerns, and you can hear more about the research that we've done. All right, that's uh, what I have. Thank you. Thank you very much, William, for the excellent presentation. Uh, truly appreciate it.
if you don't mind, stop sharing uh, yeah. your presentation. We're gonna have uh, our colleague, Aaron Hussinger. Uh, he's gonna share his slides and he will take it from here. But thanks again, William. That was a very, very informative uh, presentation. I've learned a lot. Okay, can you hear me? Aaron, we can hear you, yep. Hold on just a minute. Yep. Okay, appreciate that. Can you see the slides? Yep, we can see the slides. And sorry, um, I had to drop my video off. I don't have enough bandwidth, so I don't want to lock up here. So sorry about that. I'll come back on video here in a little bit. So I am Aaron Hunsinger with uh, One Smart Spray. Um, uh, coming to you from Southern Illinois uh, down here. So I want to take a little bit different approach uh, than William on that, give you a little more of an overview, but I think it's important to tell you a little bit about One Smart Spray. I think everybody knows who John Deere is, but I think a lot of people don't know who One Smart Spray is. I want to get into that just a little bit. So for decades, farmers have been asking, you know, how can we just put herbicides where we need it? We're doing fertilizer where we need it, right? So what, why can't we do herbicide that way? So we now have a solution. We can put it where it goes. And when you think more about it, and people I've talked to that's been using this technology uh, for the last year, they're like, I can't go back. I, I can't go back to just spraying the bare dirt. You know, it makes no sense. I need to be hitting a weed. You know, if I'm VRT and fertilizer and I put fertilizer where it doesn't need to be, it's kind of in the bank. You know, it's going to be there for future years. But when I'm spraying Roundup or 2,4-D or Liberty and I'm not going on a weed, it's just totally wasted. So there is a difference. And this slide, this really caught me here off guard here a little while back when somebody sent this to me. It's from Bloomberg. And it's actually, I mean, it's what the public thinks of us. And think about it. And we as farmers, growers, we're 1% of the U.S. population or less. So 99% of the people out there don't do what we do. And, and here's what they think of us. You know, for decades, big acre crops like and doing corn and wheat, been treating fields, farmlands, unleashing waterfalls of herbicides from long arms stretched above the crops. That's booms, of course. But the part that really got me on this is all to zap weeds that are often tiny and scattered about. You know, and isn't that what we do? And why do we do that? You know, now that we have the technology to do it, what's people going to think of us if we don't? So what if we could detect every weed in the field and spray only where they are? See where weeds are growing and how big they are. With our system, it gives different classifications on the documentation of the weed sizes. Manage resistant weeds better. I definitely think that's something that we can do with this system from some of the money we're saving. We can go in there and put in multiple modes of action on those weeds, higher rates to actually kill them with a lethal dose. Spray in different light field conditions with our system. We can go 24 seven, not saying every herbicide will work real good after dark, but the cloud cover, the darkness, it doesn't bother us. And, and we are talking about it here in just a little bit being a, a global co uh, company, but in other countries finding out they, they spray more after dark than they never thought they did. So it's pretty convenient for them, but we can visualize, document and report all application data. You know, and I, and I think this is very important because for the future, just think what it's gonna be, you know, these end users, you know, even Walmart and people are doing that, but the end user, this younger generation, they, they want to know what was put on their food. You can see from the labeling that's coming. So I think this part is important. And you think that younger generation that's what's on their food, do you think they want the maximum rate of pesticides and stuff put on or just what's needed to do it? So I think very important. So you can do all this stuff. The solution is here. I think you can see from this picture, it's a picture of one of our booms. It is in a, in a foreign country from the U.S., but there we have uh, our, our cameras kind of in the center, the white box. That's not just a, a camera, that's industrial infrared and near infrared camera lights. 
uh, flank it that are infrared, near infrared, and they're in the very center, not necessarily part of our system, be part of the OEM system, but that uh, stabilization of the boom, like William talked about a while ago. Very important, I think, for anybody that spots brand, trying to keep that boom as stable as you can. So a little bit about the company. So this is all brought to you by Bosch and BASF. And I, I tell you before, I've been around here almost two years worked for BASF before that, and never even knew all that much about Bosch. I think probably a lot of people on the call know more about BASF, you know, very large chemical company, um, very innovative, you know, well, Bosch is too, and didn't know so much about them until I really started working for them, I guess you could say. These two companies started working together in 2016 to come up with some kind of smart weed eradicator. Believe it or not, it wasn't chemicals to start with. It was some kind of mechanical means, lasers, things like that. And then they finally settled on the chemical means. Well, about two and a half years ago, the two companies formed an official joint venture together. So it is a separate company. And Bosch is a lot more than just doing power tools. You look them up on the internet, the world's leading technology supplier. They already have a lot of parts and components in these sprayers and spreaders and tractors and stuff before our systems ever go in there. So two large companies, one joint venture. And that's kind of where the one comes from. That O is part of the Bosch's logo and the square that we call an N is part of the BASF logo. So that's who we are. I want to play this video and I sure hope that the sound works. In nature, everything evolves. We learn, we change, we get better, we grow. Farmers know that. They do it all the time. From season to season, harvest to harvest, fighting weeds to protect crops in each field, balancing every aspect, managing every detail, adopting new technology, and improving yields. Farmers evolved. Weed control evolved. And so have we. Smart weed control means precision, detecting weeds and spraying only where they are, ensuring clean fields every time with maximum herbicide savings. Why stop at precision when we can be smart? SMART is optimizing your spraying program. SMART is seeing your field as never before. SMART is deciding what is just right for your field. SMART is having your data just one click away. SMART is knowing who will be at your side when you need it. And do you know what is even smarter? Having it all in one simple solution. Bosch BASF Smart Farming has joined the best of two worlds into one. The best of precision technology from Bosch and the best agronomic and digital farming expertise from BASF combined into a single solution that makes spraying precise and smart. One smart spray. One solution to make weed control simple and easy. One solution to evolve the way we spray. One solution to take precision to the next level. One smart spray. Precision made smart. Okay, appreciate that. Pretty good video. So in that, we do have a global presence, and not just in the U.S. We're in seven other countries. I know they're not all sorry, colored on the map here, uh, but uh, doing a lot of trials, a lot of work, thousands of acres. We have over 100 people working on the research and development for this, for one smart spray dedicated to that. I know at least 65 of those are Bosch engineers that, that I work with, so have a very talented crew. You can see there at the bottom, our expected commercial series launches, uh, North America 24. Very proud of that. I think that part of it makes this system, you know, three pieces to the pie, precision equipment. You know, I think everybody's got precision equipment if you have a targeted smart sprayer. Everybody's got that. 
And some of the people have digital tools, that FMIS software and record keeping system. You know, some of them have that. I think that nobody's got, but we got the agronomic intelligence and BASF brings that through the testing and the programs. I think, uh, you know, a lot of things are going to be different with these spot sprayers. You might necessarily use the same chemical program and timing that you do today. It's probably going to be different. And BASF knows a lot about that and does a lot of testing to help us out there. So the Bosch component brings us the hardware, the algorithms, a lot of things that those engineers do. And these, these parts are in-house uh, parts, most of them. So not necessarily outsourcing for that either. I talked about the cameras and the lights um, a while ago. The digital tools, Zarvio BSF brings that, giving us those weed distribution maps, the documentation. You can actually see what's happening on your phone if you want, why the sprayer is going through the field. Of course, the agronomic intelligence, just like we talked about, agronomic recommendations, the intelligent sensitivity, uh, agronomic support, technical support, all through BASF as RVO field manager. So things that we can do, um, of course we can do the green on brown, that'd be what's on the left. We're, we're pretty well doing a no-till situation, everything that's green out there, pretty easy to do. And um, like Rodrigo mentioned to start with, you know, a lot when that uh, survey was done in 21, maybe not a lot of people could do many crops. Well, we can today. You know, we today can do soybeans, corn, cotton, sunflowers, and canola, and some other crops here coming soon, wheat and barley. What's the global farming challenges? I know everybody's heard this a lot, but it, it is real. The population growing, and we're going to need to increase by 70% our food production. But something that really caught me by surprise was that 40% of the global harvest is lost due to pests. This is something we can really help out on along with below that, that resistant weeds. They are ever increasing. I know where I live, it, it's a big, big deal. And increasing regulatory complexity. Who thinks that uh, no matter who gets to be the next president, we're gonna have that uh, regulatory stuff's gonna get easier. It's not. Do you think regulators looking at this picture, this boom would rather see the whole thing spraying or just where it's needed like it is? So farmers will need to grow more food on less land while managing resistant weeds and using less herbicides. So we are the one integrated reliable system. With that, some examples, what, what does farmers need? Well, a lot of farmers want efficiency and savings. They have to, and they're growing and getting bigger. They want agronomic advice, resistance management, data and insights, reporting and documentation. I think that's essential for them. And what's some things that farmers growl about or pains that they have, you know, working with different uh, people, different face for each product, you know, just think about in sprayers, they have to work with their sprayer dealer, their, their chemical company, their retailer, their spot sprayer company in this case. So a lot of people in there to work with. Too many agritech selling pipe dreams, what will actually work, you know, not just in this spot spraying technology, but, but everything. I mean, from nutritional stuff they're putting on their crops, they're told it'll make five bushel, five bushel, and they put all this stuff on their soybeans, it looks like they'd be making 300 bushel, but they don't. So what do they believe? You know, who's going to help them sort through that stuff? You know, and a big one here, how do I know the product or the company will still be around in two to three years? And I think that is a big concern with all the startups and, and everybody for the grower. What happens if it breaks and it doesn't work? You know, big concern for them. With us, everything is integrated, reliable. We got smart weed control and the reasons for that. We are the one stop shop. We give you the precision, the digital, the agronomy, all working together for that optimal performance. Through Bosch components, connectivity, and engineering, coupled with the BASF agronomic and digital expertise. And our system is not, we're not offered in a retrofit. We are OEM integrated at the main. You order that new machine and it comes um, with it already. Superior, would you rather put on as much as needed and as little as possible or the maximum amount? Like I said before, that's what we do in our motto, as much as needed and as little as possible. 
clean fields every time. Another part of our motto is we leave no weed behind. There's no way we want to do that. And we want to turn raw data into decisions. And there's, I think there's too many growers out there today. They're making yield maps and then all kind of mapping. But what are they doing with that stuff? With our system and our field manager program, it can learn. It can learn as you go over the field, different applications, different years to even help suggest doing things different and better in the future. And you don't have to do anything to that. You don't have to look at maps and do all that. So big, big news for us in April was Agco announcing they're going with our system on the new Fent Rogators. Big deal for us. In the very next month, we had CNH publicly announced that they were going with us for their uh, targeted solution. We had another good day at the Maggie show here a week or so ago when uh, the One Smart Spray System got the best of show, the Showstopper Award for its innovativeness. Big deal for us. I was asked, you know, to kind of give some possible challenges. I know some of this will come up in the questions, but, uh, you know, I, I hear this a lot. How much chemical do I load in the spot spray tank? I, you know, I don't know. Farmers are asking, how much chemical do I order and prepay for the winter? You know, in the wintertime, I, you know, I have no idea. And getting growers to adjust chemical programs and timings of application, just doing something different than they have. You know, making two passes. Uh, residual in a spot spray if you don't have the dual tanks available. And I don't think I mentioned it, but as our system does have the dual tanks and spray where we can put on that overlapping residual as long as doing the spot spray as well. And just the startup costs. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of the challenges in there, but I think it's all well worth it. I know from going to the shows, a, a lot of people are very excited about it. So with the one smart spray system, you know, why spray non-residual contact herbicides where they're not needed? It allows you to cover more acres, you would think. Efficiency, if you're spraying less, you don't have to refill as, as much. That saving should enable for better tank mixes and more modes of action and residuals in, in the tank. Our dual tank allows for one-pass solution of spot spraying and residuals. And we're backed and installed by the OEM at the factory. We have that 24 seven application possibilities. We, our mission statement, we combine precision equipment, digital tools and agronomic intelligence into smart farming solutions that really work, make agriculture more productive, profitable and sustainable. And that's all I got. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Aaron, for the excellent uh, presentation. Uh, at this time, uh, we're going to invite uh, our next speaker, uh, Mr. Nadav Bosher with uh, Green Eye uh, to start his presentation. Uh, folks, uh, the, the chat today uh, is uh, not functional, so but you can use the, the Q&A uh, for some brief questions uh, that you may have. Uh, some folks are using the, the Q&A uh, box option. And uh, Aaron, as, as questions come in regarding your presentation, I know William was doing that already, but Aaron, if questions come in regarding your presentation, uh, you can feel free to uh, address some of those in the Q&A. So with that, uh, Nadav, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Perfect. Uh, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, perfect. So I'll, I'll present Green Eye in the next uh, 20 minutes. Um, so Green Eye, just as a general background, um, Green Eye is an Israeli-based company. So all of the R&D of the company is taking place out of, our, out of our headquarter in Tel Aviv, and then all of the sales and operation is focused in the Midwest and the U.S. as our core market. We are a technology company, uh, so we are backed by some of the strongest strategic investors in the industry alongside very strong financial investors. So a very different profile of company of what you've heard so far, more of a, you know, a fast growing tech company. And I would like to start with the company's core mission. And that is really to dramatically reduce chemical usage in agriculture while increasing productivity and profitability for farmers. This paragraph, it's what the company is all about. That's what we are developing the technology we are developing with this very simple and bold statement in mind. And as you can imagine, we are after a similar challenge and that is to really transition from the current wasteful practice of the way we spray herbicides, but other inputs as well, uh, to a very precise spraying application through artificial intelligence. 
And before I get to the product itself, um, I would like to kind of talk a little bit at a high level about how we see the value proposition for farmers, for customers. And we see four main pillars in this offering. So the fundamental one is massive reduction in non-residual herbicides. So we just concluded our second commercial season in the Midwest with an average savings for in-crop spraying green on green of 88%. Now this is massive amount of volume to save, which you know, immediately translates into the bottom line profitability. So this is one big motivation, but I think what it's really encouraging is when you look at our customers and you look at the, the, the interest that is coming to the company and you try to kind of talk to those customers and farmers, why are you interested in smart spraying and precision spraying? I think obviously, you know, saving is a big motivation, but equally as significant is also efficacy, right? So the possibility is that now you can actually not just save money, by reducing your volume, but also improve your efficacy and your wood and your weed control rate. And from our perspective, this is a big part of the success of this technology. How do we enable farmers to have more complex tank mixes, especially in an environment where resistance is becoming more and more challenging? The third angle is the data we collect on the field. So we'll talk about the product in a second, but similar to my previous presenters, we installed cameras on the machine and we essentially collect an explosive amount of data that we can later on translate into very valuable insights to customers and other stakeholders. And maybe the last piece of it is the environmental and regulatory environment. Uh, whether you're looking at through the angle of drift, which is a big pain point in the US as we all know, but really if you look at a global uh, perspective for a second, we see this trend uh, being very advanced in the EU and Australia, and we expect that to happen in North America as well where farmers will be asked to be more accountable to the volume of chemicals they're using. And in that environment, we feel this technology is more crucial than ever. So if I cannot transition to our product and offering. So as I mentioned, as I alluded, we think that in order to really maximize the value of precision spraying is really in the intersection of savings and efficacy. How can you double dip into two, those two very significant benefits? Massively reduce your chemical usage while improving your efficacy and productivity by adopting better chemicals, more modes of actions, and, and, come, and be much more aggressive on the weeds that actually do exist in the field. In addition, we are able to in, help farmers to reduce crop damage by al almost entirely eliminating spraying the crop, right? We're coming after the weeds. Our spraying resolution is extremely small. It's only 10 by 10 inches. So we are not 100% elimin eliminating spraying the crop, but, but quite close to it. Uh, and as a result, you know, you, there's less crop injury and ultimately you see it in your bottom line productivity. And of course the reduction of drift, right? Which is, you know, a very significant challenge in the US with dicamba and multiple other examples. One of the things that I think sets Green Eye apart a little bit is being very focused from the beginning on the aftermarket, right? That's been our target market since inception till today. Uh, and basically our aftermarket approach works in two steps. Step number one is we manufacture a brand new aluminum boom. So essentially we come to a customer, we will replace his existing boom, he can keep the boom for himself. And then he gets a brand new aluminum boom pre-installed with a green eye sensor. So when I say the green eye sensor, we have 12 GPUs across the boom, under a 20 foot boom. Uh, those GPUs, as mentioned before, enable us to do all the processing in real time and commercial travel speed. So we need no connectivity whatsoever. And then we have 24 cameras across the boom that scans the entire field at extreme high resolution. Those cameras, once they see a weed, they will they see an area with weeds that will trigger the nozzles to precisely sp spray this area. We have proprietary lights, so we can work 24 seven, whether it's early in the morning, whether it's pitch dark, it's absolutely no limitation on when you can use the system. So this is the first step in our aftermarket approach, putting the green eye sensor on a brand new aluminum boom on any existing sprayer. We don't care what model, what brand, what ear, we can simply retrofit a machine very quickly from an existing sprayer to a smart machine. Now, the second step in our retrofit process is not just installing a sensor, is also retrofitting the machine itself. So very early on, we understood that you know, our core competency is on the tech side, developing algorithms, but we, we realize that we can have the world best algorithms, but farmers need to, especially in the Midwest, they need to be able to put down residual herbicides across the entire field. And that's not going to change. So 
to actually see adoption, in our view, it's critical as an aftermarket, uh, a company that takes an aftermarket approach to enable the retrofit of the machine from a single tank to a dual tank configuration. That's exactly what we are doing. So we put a brand new boom with a green eye sensor, and now we're also adding a tank for the non-residual herbicides that is fitting a separate line of nozzles. So you can see in that example in the picture above, this is the main line of nozzles where you can still blanket spray the residual herbicides. And then the outer line is where we spot spray the non-residual herbicides just on the area where we actually see weeds. So we have 144 nozzles across 120 foot boom, which gives us a, a nozzle spacing of 10 inches. So a spraying resolution of 10 by 10 inches. So it's an extremely uh, high resolution spraying and we spray a very, very small area when we see place with weeds. Uh, and that's what gives us the ability to offer significant savings. So this is the second step of our retrofit approach, installing a sensor, retrofitting the machine from a single tank to a dual tank. And as mentioned before, there's multiple other benefits to the dual tank approach uh, other than residual and non-residual, which we already see our customers um, using very effectively. So the system is compatible for what we call green on brown and green on green. We are commercially available on corn and soybean, and we're about to launch a few other crops very, very soon. Uh, the system is compatible with commercial travel speed. So we like to you know, look at 15 miles an hour as an area where we recommend using. Actually, we can even go faster than 15 miles an hour if necessary. Uh, so one of the fundamental principle for us, we don't want to change anything on the operator practice. Uh, I mentioned having proprietary light so we can work 24 seven. And in addition to the real time application aspect, we have 24 cameras that generates an enormous amount of information. And our engineers are able to process this information and provide back to our customers multiple insights. So this is almost another line of value we provide to our customers in addition to the real-time savings and real-time application is the post-application analysis of all the data we capture, whether it's uh, crop stand count, weed maps, and multiple disease uh, identification, and multiple other use cases that are very valuable to multiple stakeholders. So we, we've done a lot of work, not just with our customers, but also with universities. Um, and you know, we've seen that the numbers on savings are so significant, but ultimately it tells us only part of the story, right? So what we wanted to do with the universities, this is an example of what we've done with UNL, is not just to compare what savings looks like between traditional spraying and the green eye, uh, spraying with the green eye system, but also to compare the efficacy level. This is a, a very comprehensive trial we've done with the UNL last year and, and it's publicly available. And you can see on the savings, it's very consistent with what we've seen through our customer, right? So typically burn down application, you'll get about 94% savings. And for the in-crop spraying, about 87%, 88% on average. So quite consistent, huge numbers, but it becomes really interesting when you look at the efficacy. So as far as the efficacy, what the university did here is kind of breaking it to control a broadleaf and grass weeds. And you can see on broadleaf, this is essentially identical control and there's a slight difference on, grad weeds, on grass weeds. So ultimately there's a, effectively, it's almost the same level of control with massive savings. And when you look at the cost structure, what UNL did here is trying to put together the most robust chemical plan for a Midwestern farmer that is struggling with resistance and polymer amaranth. And you can see if the baseline program is, what you can see is $105 per acre to kind of work with the strongest product, with a green eye system, it will come down to $40 per acre. So all the product that has stripes are the residual herbicides. So we spray them across the entire field. The massive savings are coming from the non-residual product, the Icamba glyphosate in that example. So in that, in that example, we sprayed Icamba at full dosage with very few something very few farmers do because it's just way too expensive. And it doesn't really matter what the baseline is of the chemical program we see that it's very consistent that we will save from a dollar perspective about 60%. So this is a little bit of another, I think, interesting observation from what we've done with UNL, in addition to the savings and efficacy, is the significant benefit as far as crop injury, which I mentioned before. And you can see some of the pictures on the right where on the fields that were broadcasted with dicamba, you see significant crop injury, where with green eye system, you don't see that, which ultimately also translated into the bottom line productivity and yield. 
So we just concluded our second commercial season in the Midwest. So we are fully available um, across the Midwest, operating commercially in corn and soybeans. Uh, we retrofit our customers' machines on all top brands, Deer, Case, Aggie, um, different ears, different models. Uh, we serve customers across the Midwest. We're now expanding to the southern part of, parts as well and globally uh, next year as well. We worked on multiple different field conditions, whether it's uh, reduced till, no till, till. And I think that's a really important part that we can, you know, offer as, as information that is validated through customers that the system is very robust, right? I think the key word with precision spraying is not whether it's work in small plots in controlled environment. It becomes much more challenging when you have to kind of get all the data from multiple field conditions. Uh, and I think that's what we are in a position to actual process and, and, and do. And we see a very stable and robust system on the field condition, whether it's the, it's the wind condition and, and, and what is the, the topography of the fields we operate in. We also launch uh, an interesting and very valuable, in our view, um, mode of what we call canopy mode. So farmers can actually, with a press of a button, spray just a crop and apply, for example, fungicides or micronutrients or other products. But in, if I have to kind of just share one piece of information from this previous commercial season that we just concluded. Uh, we saved on average, we sprayed on average only 10% of the field of our customers. And that on average equals to $30 per acre savings. And that's if I compare apples to apples. So the same chemistry they used versus putting it now in the green eye dual tank system. And that's, that's super, super, super significant. I mean, the notion that you can save 90% of your chemical usage save $30 per acre. Uh, that, that's something that once you go to operation size of, you know, two, three, 4,000 acres, that, that's something that entirely changing the financial uh, situation of those, of those farmers. So this is a quick uh, a distribution of, of some of the centers that we sell systems in. And you can see the core focus is in the Midwest with expansion to Canada. Um, this is an interesting slide, what we kind of you know, it's kind of challenging to, to put together an ROI comparison because there's multiple different scenarios um, as far as our biggest operation, what chemical plan the farmers are adopting. But I think what the, the data here reflects an average customers of ours today. So corn and soy being about 4,000 acres, typically uh, spends today about $55 per acre. So annually spends $220,000 per acre. And we offer in this 60% savings when I combine the residual and the non-residual. So taking down to $55 per acre down to $22 per acre. So this is a recurring saving of over $130,000 per acre. And we see with the, the cost of our system, a return of investment typically is about two seasons, sometimes even less. And I think that's what's really compelling and attractive in, in the concept of precision spraying. So when you can articulate a very simple value and you know the value is not associated to what's going to happen or not going to happen to yield it's just simply how much money you can save on your chemistry that's where you see massive adoption coming in and we kind of took a slightly different approach so we don't take any subscription uh, from our customers i think another thing to mention is what is the kind of a bigger mission for us as a company so we are tackling herbicide but it's really a first step in a much much broader and bigger vision um, the bigger vision is really to be able to treat the field down to the plant level. And we see three channels where we can expand the value and offering to our customers. One is on the real-time application, uh, starting with herbicides, expanding to fungicides, micronutrients, and other inputs. Next year, we're launching uh, fungicides and micronutrients, which are going to be available commercially already. On the data analytics side, we are able to show multiple analytics and, and insights to customers that they find to be super valuable, whether it's the, the end customer, the farmer or other stakeholders. And of course, expansion of our crop portfolio that we are supporting. So this is a quick, quick overview on Green Eye. Hopefully it gave you some color into what the company is doing. Uh, thank you for your time. Excellent. Thank you very much, Anada, for the excellent uh, presentation. Uh, we're gonna now uh, invite Dr. Tom Wolf uh, to share uh, his slides and start his presentation. Just one point uh, I want to make uh, regarding uh, savings while Dr. Wolf uh, loads up his uh, presentation. I think the, the idea behind savings, because that was a really common question from uh, the survey 
uh, you know, the, the questions that we received from you all uh, during the, the registration. And from our research, and then also working with the systems, I think the, the idea of savings will depend on the infestation levels, right? Uh, therefore, here continuing to, continuing to talk about integrated strategies and a strong foundation, because uh, this huge savings that we're discussing, you know, 80, 90, 70% savings, uh, they'll come uh, when you have low weed uh, infestation. So that's, that's all I want to mention here before uh, Dr. Wolf starts. So the mic is yours now. Thank you, Rodrigo. Is everything good? Can you hear me and see everything? Yep, I can hear you well, and presentation looks great. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Rodrigo. Thank you, uh, everyone, for joining us this uh, this morning, afternoon. Um, I'm located in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. I'm a spray specialist. I've spent my whole career basically studying sprays, and spot sprays are one of the more interesting and important developments uh, in my career, I would say. So I'd like to just share a few thoughts on, on them. Um, we've been working with spot sprays in Saskatchewan since uh, 1992. Uh, that's when the Concord Detect Spray first appeared here um, on some chem fallow. And the, the benefit was immediately recognizable by the customers. You know, there's savings to be had. And so we, we do want to, uh, you know, really focus on that today. Um, Recently, uh, this is a picture I took last year uh, at a farmer's field just west of Saskatoon. This is a John Deere Sea and Spray Select. Um, the green on brown feature has been a real stepping stone for many farmers where they uh, are cleaning up their fields. This is a, a lentil field that is close to harvest and the producer wanted to remove some of the green weeds. This is kosher sticking out the top and even also desiccate some uh, some green stands yet, and that would accelerate and ease harvest conditions. Um, instead of broadcast spraying the Reglone here uh, at $15 per acre, he spot sprayed it at a fraction of that cost. So it's a, a nice stepping stone for that producer. Uh, people have already mentioned the generation of, of the wheat maps, I think, are very, very valuable uh, agronomically. Um, I think any agronomist in the audience recognizes that the, the wheat mapping has been lagging. We have not been able to map weeds, uh, you know, like we've been able to map, say, fertility or soil type, because the wheat maps are, they don't last very long. They're difficult to obtain. You have to walk the field. Uh, could you imagine having a wheat map before and after spraying and throughout the season? Even just that feature is an incredibly powerful agronomic uh, value. Most importantly, though, I would say is this, and that is that the savings that we have identified at the top of the slide here should really be reinvested into multiple effective modes of action tank mixes. Um, that appears to be a, a very important strategy for prolonging the utility of herbicides. And I chose my words very carefully here. Uh, obviously, every time we spray, we add to the selection pressure for herbicide resistance. Every time we spray, whether we spot spray or not. But we can uh, prolong the ability to use herbicides by using the words in right now, the, the, the multiple effective modes of different modes of action that are effective on, on the weeds uh, present. So for example, kochia in Saskatchewan is uh, um, uh, uh, resistant to glyphosate. It's also resistant to most group twos. It's becoming resistant to some other modes of action. So your your pre-burn for kochia would include glyphosate and, and the group two, possibly for, for the other ones, but it would also have to have two additional modes of action in that tank mix. And that increases the cost of that application very significantly, but it can be made affordable by the savings presented by the spot sprays. What are farmers looking for? Uh, the most common questions I've been getting on spot sprays really are questions about the ability to detect their weeds at their stages and to do so consistently. And so the algorithms have to address very regional specific needs uh, and also very farmer specific criteria. Uh, for example, if you're in an area where uh, you have water hemp or palm or amaranth, um, you know, if that weed is is resistant, uh, it really ought not to be allowed to survive and to and to, you know, proliferate. 
So there's very a very high threshold for success here. And if, if there are survivors or escapes, then a, a respray may be necessary. And that's very expensive. Um, so that, that user's tolerance for misses can be very individual. The ROI does have to be favorable. I, I think that right now, many of the spot sprays that are available, uh, you know, made uh, made sense, made financial sense only on the larger farms because of the initial investment cost. Uh, so we do want to make sure that we open this market up for uh, more, more farmers by, by making sure the ROI is favorable for their operation as well. There's also a variable cost, and Nadav briefly mentioned the fact that they don't uh, have a subscription cost uh, for their particular units, whereas many of the others do have a subscription cost, and it could be 3 or $4 or even more per acre. And uh, there needs to be some certainty that that subscription cost is, is, is stable. I think that is, has a big, a big role to play in the ultimate uh, economic viability of the, of the approach. I think the ability to retrofit is important. Um, I, I see we've watched sprayer costs go up. Um, we've seen them pass, you know, be previous sort of <laughs> lines in the sand, I guess, for cost, and they still keep going up. And we're seeing farmers being quite overcapitalized in some areas. So the ability to retrofit onto existing equipment, uh, maintain uh, maintain a sprayer that already works for on a farm, I think would be a very important feature. And the commitment to algorithm expansion is very important. Um, the, this is an ongoing project. I think uh, producers want to hear a continued support of special crops, uh, continued support of emerging wheat issues or regional wheat issues. And so the algorithm does have to continue to grow and, and we want to see that commitment. And on the manufacturer side, you know, one of the one of the biggest, uh, I guess, um, sort of like our, uh, we don't have the ability right now basically to have low booms, low level booms, and we don't have a very good selection of nozzles that are suitable for this. And we'll get into that a little bit more. I want to just cover some some economics. Uh, we uh, we do have some new savings and some new costs to present, and I thought we would maybe spend a few moments just going over what some economics of of spot sprays might look like. So this is a low cost example. Uh, we have a spot spray here. That we have we'll have a few more others in a moment, uh, and we'll say well this is a fee. So the use fee per acre is four dollars per acre. Uh, the product price it might be generic product would be four dollars. The, the product use, you might have a 75% savings. So the ultimate product expense is just a, a product of these two numbers here, and that's $1. And then you add the user fee, and that's a $5 cost. So if you compare that to a broadcast application where you have no use fee, and you also have a, a, a relatively cheap product, you do use it over the entire field. The product expense is $4, but the actual cost of using that cheap product is actually cheaper. Uh, for a broadcast spray compared to a spot spray because of the subscription cost. So that does matter if you're looking at single use products, maybe generic products, and uh, you really have to uh, you know, compare the broadcast price to that spot fee. If we have um, a higher weed density here, we have a, let's say if we have a spot spray with a fee again, we have a fairly high uh, weed density here, the, the product cost goes up, and in fact, now the spot spray is actually more expensive than the broadcast spray. Um, if we have a spot spray with no fee, uh, we simply pocket the savings and we don't deliver any additional fees to the, to the company that sold us the product. We have a $1 per acre fee, but that's not the whole story. Um, there are some downsides to spot spraying and there's this downside of these escapes or misses and they may not be escapes, but they may, they may be misses and they may be escapes depending on how, how well the, the nozzles are configured. Let's just assume that there is a cost per acre of a miss. And what would that mean? That could mean that a respray is necessary. It could mean that uh, there's a future price to be paid uh, for the seed dispersal. It could mean that, um, you know, there's a yield loss associated with that miss. We have to add that to the potential cost, and we're just going to assume a, a missed cost of five dollars for a spot spray, and it may or may not be true. Uh, so uh, please indulge me for a moment. Uh, that that raises the net cost to ten dollars per acre. There's no miss fee with a broadcast, and um, 
and there is uh so that that now becomes really the the winning cost uh and then the other spot fees with fee and without fee uh depending on um you know depending on whether there's yeah those costs so we do have i guess uh, a slightly different picture uh spots break could in fact be more expensive than a broadcast uh, depending on the situation um but there could also be a crop health benefit and um for example, in the in the work that was done by uh, University of Nebraska with status on corn, uh, dicamba, diflufenzopyr, uh, does did cause some crop damage, and they discovered uh, that there was actually a, a net benefit, a crop health benefit by not having a broadcast spray. Now, all I've done is here is I've taken this uh, this cost, this crop health benefit. And done a, a, a 75% is unsprayed, and therefore, you know, you, you see this number here. Um, and we need to add that basically. So the net cost here is only $250 for the spot spray with a fee. Uh, for the broadcast, it's $4. The spot spray with a fee is now, in fact, the most expensive, but the spot spray without a fee actually gives you a return on the investment of $1.50 in the, in, the, uh, in the black, actually. Let's look at a higher cost. Uh, let's look at I, uh, uh, the user fee is the same, but let's look at the product price being $20 per acre. Maybe we've got a tank mix, it's more expensive. Uh, and then uh, we have a gross cost here of $9. On a broadcast, we of course have the $20 fee. Uh, the spot spree with a fee is $14. And the spot spree with no fee is now only the $5. So basically you have the $20, a quarter of that is $5 and that's your only fee. The missed cost is now higher. Let's add the $10 if we have a miss potential. And it's it, as I said, it may or may not occur, but it's an important thing to consider. Um, now the spot spray with a fee is again the, the highest, uh, the high situation if you have a high weed density. Um, and uh, the, the benefit for crop health uh, is, to, is to be added here. Now the spot spray with a fee is in fact uh, much more competitive, but it's not as cheap as the spot spray with no fee. So that, that does... Uh, you know, I think there are some costs that have not appeared in our calculations before, and they they may need to be may, may need to be considered. Uh, the second thing I'd like to uh, consider quickly is the uh, the the nozzle angle, uh, boom height, and 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 spacing. Um, this is incredibly critical for uh, capitalizing on the spot spray savings. Uh, for example, if we have a a, you know, a single activation of a, of a nozzle, we just have to spray the width of the nozzle spacing. Uh, we may still capture a weed that's in the middle, but just so it's a little bit, a little bit hairy. We may want to have a slightly a wider band, in this case, a 15 inch band. Uh, so that would mean that we have more waste. So ten, uh, five inches of this would be wasted uh, on a single nozzle activation but then we have better overlap. Let's look at now uh, superimpose on that this, this phenomenon of variable boom heights. Uh, so we've got the 15 inch spacing. Uh, we go to a low sway situation. Uh, we're overdosing by 22%. Uh, we have a high sway situation. We're underdosing by 16%. And that's only a five inch sway. That's a very modest sway. If we were to go to a 10 inch sway on this, um, a low sway would be 17 inch. That's a nine inch band. That's a, a 60 percent overdosing on that band with a high sway let's say we go up 10 inches we now have a 7.3 gallon per acre band a 20 inch wide band and it's a 27 percent underdose on that tank mix so the the importance of boom sway i think very very critical uh, when we go to an, a, a you know a, a more of a broadcast approach we trigger adjacent nozzles we have typically 20 uh, 45 percent overlap but it can go as low as 18 as high as 71 percent and that really won't affect very much, except if we have a high sway and we go down to a low situation where now we actually have misses. And uh, so the, the only way around that is to minimize the sway or to even or to widen the fan angle even further, which results in, in more potential waste when a single nozzle is activated. So I think uh, the, uh, it's very critical for uh, the sprayer manufacturers to deliver stable booms um, and uh, that will ultimately be uh, be paying dividends. The other one is really in the width and the length of the band. The length of the band uh, will depend to some degree on the travel speed uh, and the boom height as well. But let's just take two examples of a low sway. Uh, the droplets are traveling, let's say 10 meters per second. It's a sort of a guess. 
um, and they would be traveling about nine inches during that travel time. If we have a high spray, they would be traveling 20 inches, more than twice as much. So there is some uncertainty in where that spray is going to hit the weeds. And so the length of the band will have to be adjusted. And that is another potential inefficiency in the spot spray situation. I want to close with something um, that is interesting. Hopefully, uh, it's called a Jevons paradox. And the question really is, are we going to lose product? Like, are we going to basically, you know, start Start, stop selling much product and retails are going to go out of business and, and you know, it's going to be an uninteresting business for the chemical suppliers. And I want to just give you an example from history of what happened when uh, there was a problem with pollution in Industrial Revolution England. Um, they decided to develop better furnaces to reduce smog and there was actually more smog than before. And the question that was posed by uh, W.S. Jevons was why? And the answer that he he found was that the more efficient use of the resource, the better furnaces resulted in more furnaces being bought and more coal being burned and therefore actually increasing pollution. So that is the paradox. And it's usually been used in traffic studies. Uh, for example, if you have congestion, uh, you build greater roads and what do they lead to? They lead to more congestion because it encourages driving. Jevons paradox in action. So the questions are, you know, what is the elasticity of these crop inputs? What if what if the cost per acre goes down? Will there be will that be filled by uh, more tank mixing, more expensive products, uh, niche products, that kind of a thing? Um, you know, the the how much time do we have? How much time do we have with sprays? You know, this is the map. This is the trend from Canada. It's the same as it is global. It's the same as it is uh, in 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 the U.S. It's a linear line. We still have increasing problems with resistance. Uh, what is the rate of adoption of the new cultural practices that are going to be required to meet resistance issues when we have weeds that can simply not be controlled, even with spot sprays with multiple uh, tank mixes? Uh, what is the rate of change of equipment on farms? You know, this is a picture from the 70s in, in Western Canada. Here we are in the 80s, uh, maybe the 90s, and here we are in the in the 2023. So there has been a lot of turnover of spraying equipment, but, you know, how quickly will farmers be buying new material? What kind of new hardware will we need? Um, the uh, cost of a sprayer pass right now in North America is somewhere between $5 and $10 per acre. Um um, you know, that that spray pass cost may decrease if with spot sprays, if we have lighter equipment, for example, a uh, smaller tank, for example, um, autonomy. This is the a swarm farm, uh, a unit with a bilberry equipped uh, a gold acre sprayer, uh, fully autonomous, uh, five of these units in the field, a direct injection may be necessary for dealing with the, the leftover issue. Boom leveling, I've already mentioned it, but it's, it is an important issue. Uh, electrical capability on the sprayers. Those, all those kinds of things are going to be, be seen in new, in new sprayers. In summary, I would say I'm a fan of spot sprays. Um, I recognize it as a transformative technology. Um, I think that once you've seen a field spot sprayed successfully, uh, you don't ever want to broadcast spray again. Um, it is a tool that extends the utility of herbicides through multiple effective modes of action, tank mixes. Um, I think uh, there are certain new costs and benefits that need to be incorporated if we do an economic analysis of this. I think I, I am still slightly disappointed with the nozzle selection available and the st boom stability that is currently on the market. I think we have a ways to go here. That is a, 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 an area that needs uh, more investment. Um, we may have cheaper, smaller sprayers that make an individual pass more acceptable, make more frequent passes more economical. And finally, because of Jevons' paradox, it is actually difficult to predict the overall impact on product use. It is entirely possible that we will see as much pesticide being sold in, in our space as we, as we currently have, and we just do it more often with more expensive tank mixes. And we do this because it addresses emerging needs for weed control and other pest control. With that, uh, I'll turn it back over to everyone. Uh, thank you, Rodrigo, at the beginning for uh, mentioning Spurs 101. It's a free website. Jason DeVoe and I write for it. And uh, we just encourage people to use it. It's, it's intended for, for users. Thank you very much. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much for the great presentation, Dr. Wolf, and then the, you know, the thought-provoking 
comments you made there, uh, great, great point. So at this point, uh, I would like uh, to invite uh, our presenters to turn on their cameras and I wanna thank them again uh, for being here today uh, and sharing uh, about their technologies and their experiences with us. That is truly, truly uh, appreciated. Several people clapping for you all, so uh, thanks again. I would also like to invite uh, my colleagues, uh, Dr. Anita Dealey at Kansas State University and uh, Chris Proctor at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Uh, Dr. Dealey and Dr. Proctor will now lead our Q&A uh, session. And then what we've done here, we collected all the questions that you all submitted ahead of time uh, during the registration process. We're gonna be answering uh, some of them uh, during the next uh, 20 minutes or so. So thank you so much. Chris, I'll let you start. Perfect. Yeah. Thanks, Rodrigo. So as was mentioned, we've, a lot of questions came in. I think we tried to capture some that we felt were representative. Uh, I do know we're having conversations around how can we uh, answer more fully all the questions that came in. So we're, we're thinking about that. So as we post this webinar out for people to view, um, also think about ways that we can capture and, and try to answer these questions so that uh, we can continue the, the conversation because I think anytime you're discussing these new technologies, this, uh, uh, this is where a lot of the value is, is this back and forth conversation. So trying to facilitate some of that, but let's let's jump in. I'll just start with the first question. So it's really a, a two part question. I'll read it first and then we'll, we'll let each of the, the speakers address that. So the question is, you know, what's the minimum uh, weed size for detection? Uh, based on the technology and then related to that you know what's the ma uh, the maximum travel speed and and does travel speed have any influence on on detection ac accuracy so why don't we start with you William and then we'll we'll move to Aaron and and Nadav we'll we'll finish with with you yeah so whenever people ask me questions like this my common response is I always start with it depends and so but yeah our spur has the ability to see weeds down to a quarter inch but it depends on weed species, background, crop model, boom motions, like a bunch of different factors. And also it's important as thinking about what is the width rather than the height. Now it's gonna be a difficult transition for weed scientists to think about, but we really generally think about size, we gotta talk about width. And then the current offering is 12 miles per hour. Go ahead, I'm done. Go ahead, Aaron. <laughs> hey, th thanks. So yeah, like William said, it, it's going to be depend on a lot of things. I've seen uh, very small weeds hit. I don't like to give dimensions to it or if I know exactly, but you know, definitely as small or half as small as your your thumbnail, so to speak. You know, I, a lot of a lot of things depend on that. But uh, we can go 12, 12 and a half miles an hour. That's across all the green on brown, the green on green, and all the approved crops that we can do. You know, I'm sure not not stopping there, but uh, I, I do think speed does, uh, you know, affect accuracy. But I will say at our 12, 12 and a half miles an hour, we can see the weeds good and as good as we can at, at half that speed. So anybody can say they can go fast, but how many weeds are you going to miss? Thanks. Uh, anything you'd add? Yeah, no, I think as far as weed size, I want to, you know, what William said, I, I think it's you know, I have a similar, similar, I guess, comment to that question. As far as travel speed, as I mentioned, uh, our recommended is 15 miles an hour without, you know, compromising efficacy. You know, that's what we have the supporting trial and data, you know, that efficacy will not be hurt. Now you can, the system will continue to function above 15 miles an hour, but that's where we start to see, you know, higher rate of, of false positive. So recommended data support is the 15 miles an hour th threshold. I have the next question. I really appreciate everyone's presentations and has a lot of things to get us thinking, but my question's on how much variation in boom height is allowable. Um, there are field locations that have a lot of terraces, uh, common here in Kansas, where you get a quick bump up terrace trying to go over that. Um, so boom height's hard to keep stable. How do you do that as well as how does that change your speed? <laughs> and this is mine. Uh, Aaron, you'll start, and then Nadav, William, and then Tom. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So yes, it, it, it can vary. I, I would guess that uh, the variation up and down could probably go a couple feet. Maybe that's a, a foot up and a foot down. Uh, that's not exact. Uh, can go higher than that or lower than that, but we'd like to stay within that uh, 
parameters to, you know, to get good resolution. I will say that our system um, will, if it gets too high, too low, can't see good, goes in that default mode of where it's just going to spray for those nozzles that that camera uh, see. So we don't want to miss any weeds whatsoever. And kind of like Tom talked about, and we talked about earlier that, you know, it's a necessity for all these systems, I think, to, uh, to have a good stabilization system on the boom. Right. So that's it for me. Thanks, Nadal. Yeah, so as far as our system, we support a range of 12 to 50, five zero inch. That's that's the boom height we can function within. Now, if you go off range, so similar to what Aaron mentioned, those relevant nozzles will default to spray. And I think that's true to the way that the system is built in general, not just to be out of boom range, but if something happens to a camera, you all, always go to this default spray with the single purpose to minimize risk of missing weeds, right? So that really kind of mitigate the risk as far as the, the farmers of weeds being left unsprayed. Great, thank you. William? Yep, same thing. It's uh, so our boom height stability is plus or minus 10 inches 95% of the time at the tips. If it gets out of range or too low or too high, yep, defaults to the broadcast spraying. Great. And Tom, I think you covered quite a bit of this there in your presentation with some good examples. Any last thoughts on height stability? Yeah, I, th I think it's probably the biggest priority in new sprayer design is to have stable low booms for a lot of reasons. Spot spray is just the newest one. And if we don't have it, we forfeit savings. That's really it. We could be saving much more if we don't, if we have a level boom. Thank you. All right, we'll keep going. So the question here is, how does uh, weed similarity to the crop impact accuracy? So it, for example, if you have a grass weed in a grass crop or a broadleaf weed in a broad crop, uh, what, if anything, does that uh, impact the, the accuracy of the system? So we'll start with you, Nadav, this time. Yeah, so as I mentioned, we are commercially available of corn and soybean and expanding next year to additional crops. So I'll talk for corn and soybean for now because that's what we have all the you know, relevant data. So we see no difference between, in, in that scenario, we don't see that impact the system whatsoever. You know, we fed our, our algorithms based on millions and millions of images. So you know, there's a really robust way of distinguishing. I think it becomes more complicated when you're talking about identifying grass weeds in wheat, for example, something we're just starting to play with. It's more down the road for us, but I think that's where it becomes more complex from, from our perspective. Maybe I could add just a slight layer to the question. What if what if the weeds in row for the, these crops? Uh, how does that affect uh, your ability to detect the weeds at this time? Yeah. So as long as the, as the weed is visible, uh, that's that's okay. that's what will trigger. Uh, if we suspect there are weeds in a given area, we'll we'll spray it. Great, William. I'll turn it to you. Yeah, it's, it's hard. It's a lot harder. So just think of it as a human would think about it. So whenever I tell people how does machine learning work for identifying weeds, think of it like a human. If you have trouble identifying weeds in a crop as you're walking through hand weeding, the machine's gonna have the same problem. So every year it's kind of fun when my interns like do the hand weeding controls, they always miss weeds. You know, even though they've walked multiple times, there's always weeds in there. So it's the same thing with, with the system. There are gonna be some, some tough points and Weeds that look like the crop, and if they're in the row, it's it's more challenging. Perfect. And then Aaron, I, I would agree on more challenging. Haven't seen a problem with it. It's like Navav said that uh, you know got lots and lots of images and been doing this. And Tom had talked about starting out with some of these systems, green on brown and ninety two. I think that's one reason why we haven't been doing this green on green, but just a couple of years. You know, technology, imaging, getting this stuff going, but. You think about it, it's like he also said in wheat, that'd be a little tougher. But, you know, you think about grasses and corn and they look a lot different than what the corn does. So not as hard as you think in some some aspects of it. So that's that's it for me. Great. Our next question um, expands it past the use of the spot spray technologies on weed species. And, and can you comment on vision for use in managing insect pests and diseases? Okay. And first, sorry, yeah, William, you want to go? Yeah. yeah, the current offering is just for weed management, but I got to tell you, insects and diseases sound pretty cool. Aaron, Aaron, you're next. Yeah, same thing. Uh, currently just weeds, but uh, 
a lot of talk about other things. And I think the future is big in, in the other things you talked about and insects and diseases. So, Nada? Yeah, uh, same for us. I mean, I think the way we see it as a company, and I mentioned in the presentation, I think, you know, the way I like to think of it, we put set of eyes and brain on industrial machines. Uh, the first commercial application is, is herbicides and weeds, but there's much more to offer. And I think the beauty of it is you don't need to change any of the physical components to get access to those additional future benefits, right? It's just through software unlocks and then farmers can expand the value, which I think creates a very compelling offering for this technology. Great, thanks. Tom, any more thoughts on expansion? Yeah, I mean, uh, some of my customers are using green on brown uh, systems for fungicide spraying, and they're basically, it's an on-off algorithm where they select a threshold that doesn't spray their low-yielding, low and high spots and uh, just ignores them. And so they save 10, 15% fungicide uh, on a typical field. This is just data from them. Thank you. So we'll stay with you, Tom. This next one's really about educational priority. So you know, if you think about this new technology, what would you prioritize uh, for applicators thinking about using this technology? What kinds of things um, just on an educational side do you think is, is critical to be able to best use the technology itself? Yeah, I, I mean, we I do think that it is really a boom height question really for now to be able to optimize that setting. And of course, nozzle availability is part of that. I don't see, you know, I, I see this as a tool. I, I see spot sprays as a tool to prolong the utility of herbicides. I've said that already before, but that is where it fits. I don't believe that farmers need to pocket the savings. You know, our farmers will argue with me on that. I think the savings should be reinvested in the farm. I think that's where we can take this technology. We can say, okay, we, we know that, that you have a problem with these amaranthus species. And the only way to buy yourself time is to use more expensive tank mixes. This makes this possible. That's the angle. What are we doing? We're waiting for, we're waiting for, really for the time, unfortunately, the time when none of our herbicides will work on some weeds. Not everywhere, not all weeds. It just takes one weed and it's over for herbicides. And then cultural controls are the only alternative. We're trying to buy that time. I think that's kind of my messaging. All right. Our uh, next question, um, and I saw this pop up in our Q&A quite often as well. So how are farmers expected to be able to repair these technologies? What's the support for them? What kind of maintenance do you think will be needed on the machines to ensure that technology is working? And as it seems to be evolving rapidly, how long does it take before it's obsolete or outdated? First, Aaron, thoughts? Great, I'd be first on this one. This is a big one. So I think it's a tough question to answer. I, I don't think that farmers would be expected to work on this technology. I don't know how many uh, growers or retailers actually work on their sprayer today. And most of that they have, have it done. So I, I would expect with this system, you'd have a few spare parts for something that not, might get knocked off or something that you could put back on you know, be replaceable. Otherwise for us, it would be the, the OEM coming and fixing it. So as far as the speed goes on how fast they get there, it'd be how fast that OEM gets there. As far as the, uh, how long does the system last and being obsolete, I guess you could say. And I think a, our vision would be more in hopefully the first year or two, it's not necessarily hardware updates. It would be more of a software updates that you could do. And that'd be part of the maintenance that the, uh, the grower, the retailer could could do as well. But for us being obsolete, I, I look at it more as, you know, you can't wait forever to get that newest iPhone or you'd never have an iPhone, right? If this, if this works out for you and has that return on investment and does what you want to do, to me, it's go ahead and purchase it. There's always going to be new things uh, coming out. Great. Thank you. Nada? Yeah, uh, no, it's a good question. I think for us, we understand that maybe the most important topic here is service and support, right? Farmers, you know, they see all the benefit, but they see a complex technology and they want to make sure that, A, they can operate it, 
you know, in a very simple way. And then someone, if something goes wrong, will be available. So I think from our perspective, there's three lines of defenses. One is what we call like tier zero, where the, actually the farmer is getting spur parts. And if something happens in many, many cases, he can fix it himself in a very simple way. The second thing is the way the system designed from our perspective is that we can monitor each system remotely, not just down to the sprayer, but actually to the component level. And this way we can troubleshoot, I would say 85% of potential errors ourselves without sending a technician to the field. And the last line of defense is our network of, of dealers that we are keep onboarding new dealers to this network that are trained, that are close by to our customers and come and offer a very tight uh, service and support to them. So I, I see this three layers offering this very close service and support approach. Um, and then from the usability of the system, I think, you know, it, it's as simple as it gets. You get to the cab, you press a button, you tell us what crop, what mode, green on brown, green on green, it works. And I think keeping this simplicity is key for adoption. Great. William, thoughts on this one? Yeah, so there are indicators in the cab that tells you if the CN spray is functional or not. And there is a diagnostics page, which then can indicate what the problem might be. For example, like an un unplugged camera, you just go plug in the camera. Anything you know more complicated, you contact the dealership for support where they could fix those things, also do software updates. And so, so the dealership is really important in this conversation. And then regarding, you know, obsolete or outdated technology, you know, I would like to think that there are some value that growers could have for these older technologies. And you just think about tractors. I mean, there's plenty of John Deere 4020s running around from the 1960s. They're still valuable pieces of equipment. And so there is a, you know, there, I would like to think that there could be a use for this older equipment. Thanks. Tom, any thoughts on what you've seen with the equipment time support? So far, I have very little concern. Uh, and the fallback is always to go back to broadcast. So you're not stopped. And that's important. But, you know, great service makes for great stories. And great stories are memorable. And that's how good news spreads. So I just implore everyone to provide that service. Thank you. I think we touched on this next one slightly, uh, so we don't have to spend a lot of time. But um, you know, what what do you what do you see as the feasibility of using this technology on specialty crops? So let's say a turf grass system or uh, nurseries, or uh, just as a couple of examples. Um, Nadav, is that something you guys are working towards? We'll start with you and then work down. Yeah, no, so, so we're getting a lot of inbound for different applications, different markets. Uh, this is very doable. Actually, I mean, our focus is a broad acre aftermarket from a technical complexity. This is we are the most complex area, right? 50 miles an hour aftermarket industrial machines. Uh, but we're in that area because we think that, you know, that's where the, the big opportunity and the biggest pain is. So to your question, this is very feasible. I don't see that in our immediate roadmap as a company. William? Yeah, this is a hard one because, you know, we want to be able to do everything, but the tr struggle is actually focusing. So is it feasible? Yeah, I mean, it's not really difficult once you develop a platform to switch to another crop. It's just software. So then it becomes what's the efficiency of your, your, your labeling and model development pipeline to jump into other things. And so I spent a lot of time in California. People say, hey, when are we going to have this technology in vegetables? It's like, oh, you just got to wait. You know, you know, we can't do everything at once. Like we need to build the technology first. Oh, thanks, Aaron. Yeah, I, I would agree. It, it's a lot of interest in that, a lot of people talking about it. I, I think, like William said, we have to focus right now on the broad acre crop. I, I will say that I think for those specialty crops, it could be a, a huge savings for them, you know. But again, one kind of step at a time, and we got to focus on the, on the big things right now. Perfect. Tom, any, any thoughts? on this one. I uh, know I got nothing to add. We're good. Right. This one gets maybe a little more technical. Um, it was a question that we received to know a little bit more about how the software determines if one or two nozzles or more are triggered when a single weed is sensed in the middle of between two nozzles. Um, does it, you know, how, how do we, how do you manage that? So as in, will only one nozzle spray, will both spray, how many will spray? Um, if only one, big question, would it be better to outfit the sprayer with even flow nozzles to ensure a full rate across the single nozzle? 
um, since most require at least 15% overlap to get that full coverage, concern being uh, cut rates leading to herbicide resistant weeds. So I think we saw a few images in there, but yeah, how do we sort through that? William? Yeah, so hopefully my presentation kind of covered that. So Elderman machine, it makes that decision in real time. And okay. so we do use tapered flat fan nozzle tips. And why is that? To account for the bin motion. So like what Tom presented, if you use an even, you get different rates depending on what the bin height is. And so to alleviate that, uh, real-time nozzle activation determines how much it needs based on boom height using tapered flat fans. Thanks. Aaron? Yes, yeah, a lot like William said. I mean, it's going to depend if it's exactly in the middle or if even one a little closer to one than the other, but past the middle of one nozzle, probably two nozzles are going to kick on to do that. So especially being associated with BASF, the last thing that we ever want to do is try to induce any kind of resistance, you know, in the weed. So we do think about that a lot. Yes. Thank you. Not else? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a very technical question, but I'll just say that we developed customized nozzles for our precision spraying system, which essentially dismissed the need to overlap and essentially addressing this from a different angle. I think it's a bit too technical for this group, but uh, definitely working on this uh, very closely. Thank you. Tom, last thoughts on it? Yeah, it's critical to do this well. And I, I'm, I trust them with the algorithms they decide, but you know, the, the ultimate goal of the spot spray is to maximize the savings. And that's why I think we, we need to make sure that the, the single nozzle uh, activation is actually uh, a, a very big part of this, uh, as opposed to always going to a, a three a three nozzle setting. Great, thank you. Here you go. In terms of time, probably one more question. You think yeah, we'll do one or two, and then we're going to stop okay. at one fifty nine, and I'm going to bring the slide, Chris. Yep. Perfect. Uh, sounds good. All right. So this this question is maybe just thinking about. Uh, who do you see as, as being able to adopt this technology as, as you think about the economics of it and, and kind of that ramp up to market? So is this something an average an average farmer would be able to um, pursue? Would it be economical? Uh, is it more, do you see it more in like a co-op, a service provider um, a kind of situation? So uh, maybe talk through a little bit of that and what, as you shift to a new technology, does this change the business model that that maybe we need to be thinking about uh, in terms of spray application? So, uh, Tom, why don't we start with you? I know you started talking a little bit about that, but I don't know if you had maybe an additional comment or two. Yeah, I won't re reiterate what I already said on the economic side of it, except to say that you know, in in the spot spray world, we have not seen. Uh, really an uptick in custom operators providing that service and then just, you know, giving, passing the savings on and maybe charging a slight surcharge for the ability to do that. I think that's an opportunity, but it has not, not become uh, a thing up here. Perfect. Aaron, how's your group been addressing that or thinking about this? Oh, I think that, uh, you know, they talked about earlier and like, like Tom said that, uh, you know, not saying they're all going to be real cheap. So not saying a real small grower could maybe afford one of these. Do think that a larger grower, uh, we don't have a price out. So I can't really speculate on how big that grower would be. But to uh, think that larger growers can sure, uh, you know, get use out of it and, and do that pretty quickly. I think the smaller grower is going to have to go through that retailer. You know, and the retailer purchase it and run it on a lot of small growers. Perfect. Nadav, turn to you. Yeah, so I guess a similar approach. I think our main focus, if you look at our customer base today and, you know, for 24 and, and now we're selling for 25, it's it's mostly the individual farmers. So we look we look at a threshold of about 2,500 acres where, you know, the operation is big enough to offer really compelling ROI. But we also sold and, and are planning to deliver more system to those co-ops and, and retailers, which is a very different, you know, model. And I think it's really interesting to see those customers, you know, now finishing a first season with the system and trying to redesign their model from scratch. So I feel like there's a lot of experimental, you know, exercise here. Um, but these are certainly the two groups that we see that can benefit from this technology. Perfect. And William, I'll turn it to you here at the end. Yeah, I mean, with any new technology, I think you're going to see different ways of how to serve the customer. And so obviously, you know, there are different ways to do that. And um, whether it's pay per license fee per acre 
or you know cost you know just buying it i think uh the goal is to provide you know flexible options for the grower and, and then decide what's the best for them but it's a unique time you're going to see a lot of changes Fantastic. So 159, uh, we stayed on time. So excellent job, everybody. Excellent discussions uh, today. Thank you all uh, for presenting, uh, my colleagues for helping us uh, organize, Chris and Dr. Dillon, and then Glenn Nice for running uh, the Zoom uh, behind the scenes here. Uh, excellent presentations by our presenters. You know, uh, we weren't sure whether we were going to be able to put this together or not, and we did. And I'm very, very happy that we did because today was just uh, an excellent meeting in my opinion. So for uh, the certified crop advisors that uh, would like to claim their credits, you can either uh, scan uh, the QR code on the screen here. So that's for uh, folks here in the United States. Or if you don't have access uh, to a device uh, you know, to scan, you can simply email me your name and your CCA number, uh, and I'll take care of that for you. So my email is rworley at whisk.edu right here uh, on your screen. So I'll give you uh, 10 more seconds here either to copy my email or to scan the code. Rodrigo? Yep, Glenn. Uh, for those of you that have open questions, maybe our panelists can sort of go through some of these questions and you can sort of stay on for a little bit to see if uh, your question is answered. There are 14 open questions still available to be addressed yep. we're well, i propose we collect those questions uh, we're going to send out a follow-up survey and when we put that follow-up survey we can address uh, some of those just uh, so we can respect uh, time for our uh, speakers and our participants but thanks for bringing that up glenn and thank you all for uh, putting the question so when you glenn if you don't mind if you can just copy and paste all those questions for us we'll have them addressed later okay so thank you uh, and with that I just want to thank you all again uh, for joining. Uh, enjoy uh, the rest of your day, your night, or your morning, depending uh, where you're at. So thank you all very, very much. Thank you. And Chris, if you'd like to stop uh, the recording.